First Thanksgiving is a moment of great irony in world history. In a violent age where Europeans and indigenous peoples killed each other, committed crimes against each other, and tried to destroy each other, the Thanksgiving feast of 1621 was a moment of peace and brotherhood between two cultures. Two worlds came together to take part in one of the most sacred, God-ordained traditions in humanity, eating food together. The most pivotal moment in world history, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, is remembered and has been remembered for 2,000 years with the breaking of bread. And someday when human history culminates with the final victory of Christ in the new heavens and the new earth, the victory will also be celebrated with a feast. So it was with the first Thanksgiving. That day in 1621, two worlds came together to give thanks for the sovereign God who had brought them together and for his loving protection over them. But how did this miraculous event even happen? Who were the chief players? And what events in world history led them to a feast table? And what can we learn from them in an age that is terribly void of goodwill between those who are different from one another? Well, I'm Seth Udinsky, and in this very special Thanksgiving episode of A Moment in History, Let's journey back together to the first Thanksgiving and take part in the kindness and goodwill between two different worlds. Indeed, there were many people who played a part in this first Thanksgiving. English governors, Puritan pastors, Native American chiefs, and common folk. But what I want you to get most from this story is that above everything else, the sovereign hand of God is at work to accomplish his good purpose for his glory and for the good of his people. So may God, the true hero of the Thanksgiving story, be glorified. Happy Thanksgiving from all of us at FISM TV. Now let's journey back together and explore today's moment in history, the first Thanksgiving. Now, the world on the eve of the first Thanksgiving was a violent and cruel place, as we said earlier. In the Middle Ages, Europe was split into various tribal kingdoms, and generally each one did enough damage to the other, so much so that no one kingdom really grew in great power. But at the dawn of the Age of Discovery in the early 1500s, that all changed. European empires each capitalized on a convergence of technology that allowed them to amass huge amounts of land in the New World. Thus, for really the first time in the West since the fall of Rome, one nation could rule an enormous amount of land. Spain was the first, reaching the New World under the command of Italian explorer Christopher Columbus in 1492. France and Portugal followed, but where we will focus our time is on the conquests of England. For it was out of England that the foundations for the first Thanksgiving and the American nation itself would be born. Now we have to understand the danger and risk of taking a venture such as the Mayflower journey at this time. There were no ironclad ships at this time. There were no steamboats, no high-speed vessels. Marine travel was very much the same as it had been for thousands of years. Wooden ships relying on manpower and favorable winds to travel great distances. Journeys across the ocean would have been considered life-threatening and for good reason. With no modern technology, ships were basically at the mercy of whatever stormy weather overtook them. Sanitation was very bad, food supplies were often limited, and close quarters often made water travel a dismal experience. And of course, remember the time period we're studying. In the early modern world, pirates were always a threat, especially to ships filled with colonial settlers where there were often women and children on board. And to add to that, even if the venture succeeded and the colonists arrived at their destination, there was no guarantee of survival. Remember, they were going to a remote land far from home. The inhabitants of the lands did not always take kindly to newcomers, and as a result, some expeditions before the Mayflower were doomed. Take, for example, the settlers who arrived in modern-day North Carolina in the late 1580s. Englishmen established a colony that became notorious throughout history for its eerie disappearance. The predecessor to the Plymouth Colony, which met a fate all too common in this time period, was the lost colony of Roanoke. This true mystery story begins in 1587, when a group of 115 English colonists set sail from England for the New World. 
The colonists landed on Roanoke Island, just off the Atlantic coast of present-day North Carolina, in August of 1587. The colony had been established by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1585, and it hit turbulence. But under the leadership of new Governor John White, the colony was able to survive. Although every colonial venture at this time was dangerous, the first stages of Roanoke were met with relative success, and the colony was on the way to survival. Later in 1587, Governor White returned to England to gather more supplies. However, he was forced to remain in England to deal with an all-important war against the Spanish Empire. In 1588, the English defeated the Spanish Armada in one of the most important victories in English military history. After that victory, Governor White set sail to return to Roanoke and the colonists there, among whom were his daughter and granddaughter. White returned to find the colonists and any trace that a colony had ever existed there utterly vanished. Historians have been baffled by the disappearance of this colony. White found nothing of Roanoke except for one clue, the word Croatoan carved into a tree. As you could expect, a mystery like this brings with it a flurry of conspiracy theories, ranging from supernatural forces to aliens. But the truth is, we don't know exactly what happened to Roanoke. However, we do have some clues as to a few legitimate possibilities. Possibility number one, the colonists were hit by a natural disaster, such as a drought, and they were killed from that. There was indeed a drought reported in this region in the late 1580s, so that could have destroyed the colony. Possibility number two, the colonists were killed or taken captive by Native Americans. Some argue that the word Croatoan, which remember was carved into the tree that White discovered, was in fact a clue that the colonists had been taken to a Native American island 50 miles south of Roanoke known as Croatoa. Sure enough, Governor White went there to find them, but found nothing. Perhaps the natives killed them or allowed them to assimilate into their tribe. Possibility number three, the colonists, realizing that they could not survive in the New World, attempted to return to England and were lost at sea. Another likely account, and it could explain how everything disappeared. Well, we don't know what happened to Roanoke, but we do know this. The story of Roanoke will remain one of the most intriguing true legends in the history of America, and perhaps one day the mystery of this lost colony will be solved. Now, to further understand the need for the Mayflower Voyage and the first Thanksgiving, we have to see how religion impacted the story. For roughly a thousand years, Europe had been dominated by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this of course all changed with Martin Luther and the reformers of the 16th century. Luther and the rest focused much of their reformation on bringing the church back to its foundation, not tradition or acts of piety, but on the divine word of God. The scriptures, not tradition as the church claimed, or human reason as the growing Renaissance humanists claimed, was the final authority over all life and governance. After all, the word of God is, in fact, literally the words of God. So what does this have to do with the pilgrims on the first Thanksgiving? Well, actually, it has quite a lot. You see, the Reformation first reached England with King Henry VIII in the early to mid 1500s, who broke away from Rome because he wanted to divorce one of his wives and marry another. By the way, Henry did this a lot, and we simply don't have time to go into his jaw-dropping story of how he murdered multiple wives, mainly because they didn't bear him the children he wanted. The Church of England was founded, but the history of the Church of England is somewhat marked. It had some noble qualities, but it was also corrupt in other areas, sometimes seriously so. In the late 1500s, there arose in England a group of faithful Christians who would become known as separatists. They saw the corruption in the church, and they determined that just like the church in Rome, it could not be reformed from within. They resolved, therefore, to separate and start a new congregation built on the sure and steady foundation of the Word of God. This, of course, brought with it a new level of persecution so they did what many of us would dare not to do. Instead of rolling over and returning to what may have been comfortable, they escaped England in the early 17th century and crossed the North Sea to Holland. Now, for various reasons, the separatists felt they simply could not stay in Holland, one of which was a simple desire to retain the culture of their home country. As a result, talks of a voyage to the New World, only newly discovered 120 years earlier, began to rise. 
And as it turned out, that is exactly what would happen in 1620. A group of just over 100 separatists, 35 of whom were known as Puritans, returned to England to prepare for a voyage to the New World. And in September of 1620, the Mayflower left Plymouth, England on its way to the New World with 102 passengers. The background to the famous voyage goes like this. The church in England was forcing its patrons to worship in accordance with the church over and against what the scriptures taught. Now, a group of Christians in the region decided that they could not continue on like this. They were Protestant Christians who wanted to break free from the Church of England to worship God according to the scripture. These believers became known as separatists. They faced persecution in England, so they turned their sights to the New World. After a brief stop in Holland, the separatists returned to England to prepare for a voyage to America. Forty members of the separatist movement joined a crew of other English travelers aboard an 80-foot long and 24-foot wide ship called the Mayflower. Originally, the journey was supposed to involve two ships, with part of the crew boarding another ship called the Speedwell. Now, the Speedwell never made it into the ocean due to a leak, so all 102 passengers crammed into the Mayflower to make the journey across the Atlantic. The crew left on September 16th, and the journey took 60 days. It was a difficult crossing. The close quarters resulted in rampant sickness, filthy living conditions, and disease. 102 passengers left England, and almost all of them made it to their destination, which, ironically, was in the wrong place. The Mayflower voyage was meant for New York, but they miscalculated their direction and ended up in the harbors of Plymouth, Massachusetts. The colonists drafted a document for their self-governance called the Mayflower Compact, and this would provide the parameters for the new experiment in the New World. The Mayflower Compact would also lay the foundation for later attempts at self-governance, including the American Constitution. The Compact still swore fealty to the British Crown, but as you know from history, its successor, the Constitution, did not. Now, the cost of the Mayflower voyage was great, as roughly half of the colonists did not survive the first winter in the New World. But the foundation of freedom, specifically the freedom to worship God based on the commands of Scripture and not the commands of a king, was laid, and the world would never again be the same. Nope. Oh, hey there. Are you tired of the same old news that you've been reading just constantly over and over and over the same things and the same messages? Well, here at FISM, we understand that news needs to be done a little bit differently. And that's why I'm part of the program, FISM News. See, many news stations pretend to be uninfluenced or unbiased while pushing some kind of secret agenda. But we're upfront about who we are. We're Christian, we're conservative, and we give you news that you can trust and depend on it. Thank you so much. And obviously it takes more than just me to actually bring you the news. We have a dedicated and passionate team, thank you so much, that aims to bring you the facts and data that you need from the biblical and conservative perspective that we strive towards. Follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at FISM News, and be sure to check out our website at FISM.tv slash news. Hey there, it's Samuel Case from FISM News. If you're enjoying this feature length A Moment in History show, and of course you are, I mean, it's awesome, you can go on to FISM.tv slash news to find the full archive of all our A Moment in History minis. It's right on the homepage for FISM News. You'll be able to go through a back catalog, explore through the ages from ancient history up through the medieval period, all the way to the modern day with some fun, uh, interesting stories in between that you might not have heard in your history class while you were in high school. You'll want to check it out on FISM.tv slash news. Expand that knowledge, impress your friends. Now back to the show. Well, the Pilgrims arrived safely in Massachusetts with almost all of their 102 passengers. Interestingly enough, they landed at Plymouth with 101 passengers. They lost two at sea, but a baby was also born on the ship. But as you also heard, the Pilgrims were hit very hard in that first winter. In one of the harshest winters in the story of America, half of the population was killed in the winter of 1620 into 1621. 
51 pilgrims died due to the harsh weather conditions and rampant disease. Now, try for just a moment to place yourself in the position of one of those colonists who survived. You were driven from the only home you ever knew because you wanted to worship God in a biblically faithful way. Faced with no other choice, you were forced to escape to a new country that was largely uninhabited and, at least in your understanding, a dangerous and savage place. You probably left family and friends behind forever, knowing that you would likely never see them again, and possibly never even communicate with them again, because remember, communication could take months or even years, with the delivery of mail as the only way to communicate over great distances. You boarded a ship with family members, but mostly with strangers, and your chances of survival on a ship were not guaranteed, as we spoke about earlier. Ocean travel was arduous at the time, and sure enough, the Mayflower voyage was a brutal crossing. Well, somehow, you made it to the New World and experience initial success, but then winter comes. Many people die, and many others get sick, many of whom are your friends and family. Perhaps you wonder, was this all worth it? Why would I go to almost certain death and definitely certain trials just to be able to worship God as the Bible commands? Was this all really worth it? Well, the pilgrims counted the cost, and the cost was worth it. God would provide in great ways for these faithful believers. Specifically, God provided help from the people who were already there. Remember, the theme of God's providence and sovereignty rings true in this story. God's providence was at work when the pilgrims came into the friendly company of an English-speaking Native American from the Pawtuxet tribe in present-day Massachusetts named Squanto. Now, right away, you have to ask the same question that I did when I first heard this, and that's this. How in the world did the colonists manage to meet up with an Indian who was not only friendly to them, but also understood their language and culture? Keep in mind, the colonists weren't even supposed to be in Plymouth. They ended up in the wrong spot. Again, our answer is found in the providence of God. It was the hand of God that brought the settlers and Squanto together. Now, how did he do it? Well, that's an interesting story in and of itself. Squanto, also known by the name Tisquantum, had had run-ins with English colonists before. We know very little about his early life, only that he was born sometime in the late 16th century and lived as a member of the Pawtuxet tribe, as I said earlier. In the early 17th century, his fate changed forever when he was taken captive by English explorers. Now, there are some conflicting sources here. Some say Squanto was kidnapped by the famous English explorer John Smith, yes, the same John Smith from the movies, who helped establish the Jamestown colony in 1607. These historians argue that Smith brought Squanto back to England to be sold into slavery. Now, others claim he was kidnapped by different English explorers and actually returned to the New World, which remember was his homeland, with John Smith. Now, the specifics of that don't really matter much for our purposes, other than maybe your perception of the famous explorer from the famous children's movie. Maybe John Smith was a scoundrel, or maybe he was a hero, like most explorers in that day, possibly a little bit of both. But either way, we do know that Squanto was kidnapped by English explorers and brought back to England for a time. Now, this is vitally important because it was here that Squanto learned English. Again, we don't know much about his time in England, except that he probably was meant by the settlers to be sold as a slave and successfully escaped. He returned to the New World in time to meet the settlers thanks to another English-speaking Indian named Samoset. Now, it was Samoset who first agreed to help the pilgrims, saying his famous line, Welcome Englishmen, if you've ever heard that before. Samoset had learned broken English from brief contact with settlers as well, so the fact that he was able to connect the settlers with Squanto was another act of divine providence. As it turns out, the meetings between Squanto and the English was just another act of providence, as the English had just endured that brutal winter in which they lost half of their colony. The killer was a combination of things. Disease, a lack of provisions, and harsh cold weather ganged up on the poor colonists, and there is a chance the colony would have met the same ill fate as that of Roanoke had it not been for the vital assist 
from the kind and providentially English-speaking natives. And so the colony survived. Under the leadership of English Governor William Bradford, the first spring and summer of 1621 saw a productive year for the colony. Equally important was the peaceful relationship between the colonists and the natives, fostered by their mutual friend Squanto, who, by the way, would eventually become an official member of the Plymouth Colony. William Bradford and the famous Chief Massasoit, leader of the Panakotet tribe, would both be in attendance in that first Thanksgiving feast. And now, 400 years later, as you sit down to a Thanksgiving meal with your family and friends, let's explore that first Thanksgiving feast in the fall of 1621. And you may wonder, well, wasn't it November of 1621? Well, it is true to say fall because we don't know the exact date. We do know from William Bradford's account that the feast took place sometime during harvest season between the months of September and November. We celebrate Thanksgiving today in the fourth week of November, which is typically recognized as the end of the harvest season. But the reality is that first Thanksgiving could have been enjoyed any time during the fall of 1621. We just don't have the specifics to pin down exactly when it was. What we do know is that roughly 50 English settlers attended the feast. The majority of them, roughly half, were children. Interestingly enough, the pilgrims were outnumbered by the natives almost two to one, as roughly 90 Indians attended, including the Indian chief Massasoit. Now, the question has to be asked, why did the feast even happen? Well, it's simple. The settlers were giving thanks. They had made it through one year in the new world, and after a wicked first winter, they'd had a bountiful harvest and wanted to celebrate. They had survived in a foreign land where they could freely worship God, and they had found new and vital allies in the natives. They had a lot to be thankful for. They were incredibly grateful for these blessings, knowing that they did not deserve them, but instead they were given them as a gift from a loving and sovereign God. So they did what humans have done for thousands of years before, and what the saints look forward to at the culmination of all things in glory. They sat down for a meal, and broke bread together. The meal would not have been a typical Thanksgiving meal that we might see today, a feast with turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and pumpkin pie. At the first Thanksgiving in 1621, the pilgrims and natives likely would have eaten fish. And some sources say that the seafood off the coast of Massachusetts at this time was both plentiful and delightful. They would have also eaten vegetables such as cabbage, lettuce, carrots, and onions and local fruits such as grapes and cranberries, although most likely not cranberry sauce, which if you're like me, wouldn't have bothered you too much to forego the cranberry sauce. One common food item from that first Thanksgiving that we still see today though was pumpkins. Native and English farmers would have grown pumpkins and squash, and there's a good chance pumpkins made it to the first Thanksgiving table, though perhaps not in the familiar pie form that we all know and love today. In addition to Chief Massasoit, some of the other notable attendees at the feast were Governor William Bradford and Captain Miles Standish, two of the most important leaders of the Mayflower Expedition. Another was an aged pastor by the name of William Brewster. Brewster was one of the few learned men on the journey, and it is likely he served as the de facto first pastor of the Mayflower Colony. Tradition has it that it was Brewster who prayed the prayer of thanksgiving and gratefulness to God before the meal, which was actually the first ever blessing of a thanksgiving feast. The feast likely would have lasted two or three days, not just one day as we celebrate today. It was no doubt a time of great joy, gratitude, and merriment for the colonists and their native companions. Well, you know the rest of the story, but some specifics may need to be filled out. In our day, it's popular to paint the pilgrims as evil conquistadors who violently stole the native's land. And unfortunately, in later times and other regions of America's history, there's some truth to that. But not in this band of believers in Plymouth. Historians estimate that after this first Thanksgiving feast, the pilgrims and the natives enjoyed generations of uninterrupted peace. Some sources say it lasted as long as 60 to 70 years before a serious conflict arose. 
Well, the Thanksgiving holiday survived where Americans would remember this inspiring feast with a meal of their own in various ways depending on the time period and the region. In 1863, during the darkest period in American history during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln dedicated the final Thursday in November, the very end of the harvest season on the eve of the dark and cold winter as the official Thanksgiving holiday in America. And now 400 years after that first Thanksgiving, we still celebrate. But here's where the rubber has to meet the road. The question I wanna ask you is, what are you thankful for? Perhaps this year you don't have much to be thankful for. You may say family, friends, whatever. Maybe you give a trite answer knowing deep down that you don't have much thankfulness in your heart. But friends, I want you to know that if you know the Lord Jesus as your savior, as many of those faithful Puritan believers did, you have all the reason to give thanks. Think about it. God, in his perfect sovereignty and grace, has given you the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ's perfect once for all sacrifice on the cross. The truth is you and I deserve right now to burn in hell for all eternity because of our heinous rebellion. But God has given you and me the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. God, the hero of the Thanksgiving story and the hero of all human history, gives us every reason to be thankful even if we don't feel it. He is the true hero of Thanksgiving after all, just as we saw bringing strangers together as friends ultimately to make much of his name for his glory. Should we not also regard him as the hero of our own salvation story? After all, salvation is a loving act of God and God alone. He did the work and he gets the glory. Maybe you're watching this documentary today and you're not a Christian. I ask you, what is it that's keeping you from trusting in Christ as your savior? There is no better time to experience the ultimate peace and thanksgiving when you know your soul has been saved from sin than the time in the calendar year dedicated to giving thanks. So I hope this program has blessed you and I hope you learned something that maybe you didn't know before. But most of all, my prayer and the prayer of all of us here at FISM TV is that this program would encourage you to see and savor Almighty God, the true hero of Thanksgiving. So once again, happy Thanksgiving, friends. And thank you so much for joining me, as always, on this very special day for a moment in history. Thus, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light kindled here hath shone unto many. Well, if you enjoyed this video, let us know by commenting down below. And for more historical content, just hit subscribe. I'm Seth Udinsky, and I will see you next time on A Moment in History.